Hello again. Okay, so for lecture eight here, we're just going to talk a little bit more about these white cells that we call the granulocytes. Wake up, PowerPoint. There we go. <clears throat> All right, so your granulocytes, again, um, there are three types of your white blood cells that fall into this category, and they're called granulocytes because when you stain them with dyes and look at them under the microscope, uh, their cytoplasms look very spotty, and those spots represent these granules. The stain that's used typically on a blood smear is called right stain, and it contains a combination of blue and red dyes. Different components in cells take up more or less of those two uh, dyes, which gives things different colors to help you distinguish the different cell types that you're seeing there. So these granules are really little membrane-covered compartments where various chemical substances are stored that are necessary for the functions of these particular cells. Okay, so in general, your granulocytes are bigger than your red blood cells. So like you see here in this picture, you know, all of the little pink uh, cells there, of course, are red blood cells. And then there's an eosinophil. So it's quite a bit bigger than your typical red blood cell. Here's a basophil. Here's a neutrophil. So in general, they're going to be larger. They don't live quite as long, believe it or not, as your red blood cells, which, as we already know, last about 100 to 120 days. So these are generally going to be shorter lived. All of these do a process called phagocytosis, which is basically capturing things from your surroundings, bringing those substances um, off in their microorganisms into the cell, and then digesting them, murdering them and breaking them up into various little pieces. So all three of these cell types are phagocytic to some degree. However, the one that you should really keep in mind as being your best um, phagocytoser or your most phagocytic cell among the granulocytes is the neutrophil. Okay, so what is this process that we're calling phagocytosis? You've probably seen some of this before. Uh, in Biology 201. Um, phagocytosis occurs. There are cells uh, whose job it is to do these types of things, um, especially your neutrophils and then your macrophages also. We've talked about those before and how they're the vacuum cleaners of your body. So something like a bacterial cell here that needs to be destroyed um, will attach to the surfaces of these cells. They actually have little receptors on their surfaces that are, are good at sticking to things like bacteria. Or, in the case of a macrophage, they'll stick to things like old, worn-out red blood cells that need to be replaced. So then the, the poor little bacterium or other particle is brought into a membrane-covered compartment. The cell membrane kind of wraps around and pinches off and forms a little membrane-covered compartment. That is called a phagosome. That then merges with lysosomes. Remember lysosomes from Biology 201? Those are little membrane-covered compartments or organelles inside cells that contain lots of digestive enzymes. And then there are also some toxic chemical compounds in there as well that help kill and destroy microorganisms that have been ingested. So these two fuse together, and those digestive enzymes get dumped around the poor little microbe here and it winds up getting chopped up into lots of little pieces. Any materials that cannot be further digested, that little membrane covered compartment travels back to the cell membrane and dumps those wastes out into the surrounding tissue fluids. And then those, of course, can get picked up and moved into the blood and then uh, released from the body through the different ways that you get rid of waste type materials. All right, so that's phagocytosis. And then in terms of granulocyte function, just kind of hitting some of the highlights about these different types of cells here. First of all, your neutrophils. These are your most numerous type of white blood cell. Um, here's what one typically kind of looks like under the microscope. They're um, sometimes called polymorphonuclear leukocytes or PMNs. That's another uh, term you should no refers to neutrophils because it's not unusual to hear that expression used clinically or sometimes polys is another name for these polymorphonuclear so nuclear is referring to the nucleus poly means many morpho refers to shape 
the nuclei of, an, uh, of neutrophils have many shapes. So what you see over here, um, in these stains, the dark purple areas are usually the nucleus of a cell because the DNA takes up a purple dye really strongly, binds it very strongly. So that is actually one nucleus inside that cell, but it's divided up into different lobes or compartments. Sometimes their nuclei look like a string of balloons or a string of sausages. And that's also called a multi-lobed nucleus. And that is a hallmark of a, a PMN or a neutrophil. The little granules in there contain hydrolytic enzymes. Remember hydrolysis from Biology 201. Those are chemical reactions that um, use water molecules to help break down larger organic molecules like proteins and lipids and carbohydrates into their building blocks. So those are good things to have if you want to destroy a bacterial cell which is built from all these organic molecules. You need these types of enzymes to help break down all those um, different organic molecules. And there are other antimicrobial substances inside those granules as well that will help destroy uh, microorganisms that have been brought in. Key thing to remember with neutrophils, they are very phagocytic. They're strongly attracted to bacteria especially as opposed to other types of microorganisms like fungi and uh, viruses and so forth. They're sometimes called your bacteria slayers. So that's the key things I would remember with neutrophils in addition to some of the descriptive things we've talked about in terms of what they look like. They're very phagocytic. They especially love to phagocytose bacteria. And they're also first responders. They're going to be, because you've got so many of them in your blood, when you have an injury or an infection, these are going to be among the most abundant white blood cells that come first out of your blood vessels and start attacking um, things like bacteria that might have invaded an injured area. All right, your next granulocyte, eosinophils. And eosin here is referring to a red dye that's part of the stain that they use, that right stain that they use to stain um, blood cells. The granules inside these cells take up the, this red dye called eosin very strongly, and it gives these cells um, a much redder appearance than a neutrophil would have, typically. So you can see how the cytoplasm here on this eosinophil looks pretty spotty. And those granules contain lots of toxic chemicals and, and digestive enzymes inside them. And what these cells are especially known for, um, two things. One is that these are cells that are especially good at fighting parasitic worms. Like if you had a tapeworm or a hookworm, these cells attach to those types of things and dump all of these nasty chemicals onto the surface of the parasitic worm and um, hopefully will help digest and destroy the worm. Then eosinophils also play roles in allergies and things like asthma, which is a severe lower respiratory um, allergy problem. So a couple of different roles for eosinophils that you should uh, keep in mind. The nucleus is usually bilobed, so two lobes, which you can clearly see in this picture. This is one nucleus. It looks like a dumbbell, and there's one part of the nucleus. There's the other, and there's a little strip in between um, connecting those two parts of the nucleus. When you see these under the microscope, sometimes they look like a cell with sunglasses on or an alien face is often how you uh, identify these. All right, then finally, your basophils. These are your rarest type of white blood cell. Um, you now, sometimes you can look at a blood smear under the microscope and you can sit there and, and go back and forth all over the slide and, and never see one of these. The nucleus is, sometimes it has one, may just have one area or two areas that are kind of squeezed or pinched off. Um, the nucleus is purple, but the granules also take up the purple dye in the right stain that's used to stain our, our uh, blood cells. And so sometimes you can't even really see the nucleus all that well, which is what you're seeing here in this particular photograph. That kind of area here I'm outlining with the cursor is the nucleus and then you can see all of these granules that have taken up the spotty areas that have taken up that bluish dye. 
the granules in these cells contain chemicals that help stimulate the inflammation process. And um, one of those is histamine. And so you've probably heard of antihistamine before. That is something that you take to help you fight allergies when you have allergies. And when you have an allergy, what you're actually experiencing is inappropriate inflammation due to things like pollen grains that you have breathed in during particular times of the year. Histamine is a chemical that stimulates inflammation. So if you take an antihistamine, it helps counteract those types of things. These are functionally similar to mast cells. So you have mast cells in your connective tissues and their job is to detect things like injury and infection and they stimulate the inflammation process to help recruit in the troops to help clean up the injury and fight off the infection. So mast cells are always stationed in your connective tissues and um, basophils will move in out of the bloodstream into an injured or infected area and help keep sending out those signals for as long as you need to send them out. Hey, you know, we need to, some more white blood cells in here to help fight infections. We need um, more monocytes to come in here and turn into macrophages to clean up all of the, the dead and damaged tissues. All right, so we keep mentioning inflammation. What do we mean by inflammation? Um, and we'll cover inflammation more when we get to unit three. But just kind of in general here, inflammation is a process that gets stimulated um, due to injury or infection. And like you see here, if you have a little splinter that's breaking through the epidermis of the skin here, and that will drag bacteria, bacteria all over the place out in the environment and on your skin, that drags bacteria down into this injured part of the dermis. You have macrophages that are gobbling up the bacteria. You have mast cells, which are kind of like basophils that are always stationed in your connective tissues. And um, both of these cell types will detect the injury and the infection. They release chemical signals. Those chemical signals cause uh, the capillaries, the blood vessels, in those tissues to dilate and expand so that increases the blood flow to those areas. That allows what you're seeing right there and right there white blood cells to exit those blood vessels by diapedesis so they can come out here and help fight off the infection and clean up the damage and so over here you're seeing lots of phagocytosis going on. When your blood vessels dilate like that they become leakier so plasma in the blood leaks into these tissue spaces and that causes swelling. So you guys know when you have inflammation you have a um, swelling that takes place and that's why. Alright again we'll, we'll talk a little bit more detail about inflammation when we get to uh, the immune system in Unit 3. I just wanted to introduce that concept here. Alright next video clip we're going to just hit some highlights on the roles of your A granulocytes. Your A granulocytes are the ones that don't have obvious granules in their cytoplasms and your A granulocytes include your monocytes and your lymphocytes.